Welcome everyone. We're here today for the eighth episode of the We Can Do Better Conversations. Uh, welcome Nancy, my co-host, and we have our guests today, Shelly Brown and Reese Thomas, to talk to us about something that's important to us in everyday life, whether our personal life and our relationships or in work. And we're going to touch on the various different aspects of presence today in our conversation. And so to start off with, to frame the conversation, what is presence? Shelly, what, what are your thoughts in terms of what is presence to help us frame the conversation and uh, dive deeper into it? Thanks, Brian. This is absolutely my favorite topic. In my work in mindfulness, I invite people to explore practices to help them be more present, to extend the time in the present. And what that means is we can't clear our minds, but what it means is we notice when we're getting distracted and mindfulness and being present is really just about being right here, right now. And that's what it means to me. Thank you for that, Shelly. It's so important, right? Just to be in the present moment. Reese, what are your thoughts in terms of what presence is and, and then maybe even why it's important for us to pay attention to presence? Sure, yeah. So um, firstly, thank you for having me on here. It's a real honor to be on the show. Um, this is a subject that's really uh, important to me and it's something that I've been um, learning a lot about with people like Shelly and Teresa. And for me, presence is a gift, pun intended. Um, it, it, the, the, a lot of my life, a lot of my growing up, a lot of the experiences I've had have been, you know, focusing too much on what other people have thought, what other people's expectations might be, focusing on what the anxieties lie ahead of me, and then worrying about how things have gone wrong in the past. And not once did I stop and slow down and become more patient and understand the benefit of being present in the moment that's where the opportunity is, that's where the growth lies. And for me, in the work that I do with emotional intelligence and self-awareness, it's key to developing <clears throat> a better understanding of our own potential and our true self. Excellent, thanks for that, Reese. Nancy, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think about being present, a couple things come to my mind. One is, it's a practice this idea of being present. Because I, I can relate to what you're saying, Reese, around this <clears throat> idea of like, it's not something that I can say that I'm naturally great at. <laughs> it, it's a practice. It's a, it's a building of a, of a muscle to be present. And the other thing that came to my mind um, around presence is that I like the word that Reese used around this idea of it being a gift. So when, when I think about it, it's like a gift to yourself. It's also something that we are able to give to others to just be there with them. Um, whether it's moments of joy, moments of grief, like our ability to actually be with somebody is, is a sign of love for love for somebody. Yes. I use the L word. <laughs> Uh, is a sign of love for somebody. And so, yeah, so those are a couple of things that stick out, but I, I really truly recognize the practice around it, that it's not something that just happens, at least not for me. That has not been my experience. I've, something that I've had to, I, I have, I continue to practice to be present. I, I love where you're pointing us in terms of a practice and that it's a consistent muscle that we need to develop, Nancy. Yeah. I love uh, your language around that. And so for me, my journey to presence uh, was about connecting to myself. It's about quieting all the noise. Like um, Reese was talking about, you know, what are people going to think of me? Um, and all the energy about um, how you're going to be seen. What will they think? Am I right? Am I valued? All the, all the kind of um, things that might come up for us. What might go wrong? What do I have to do three days? You know, I've got this, project three days it's doing three days and kind of looking either into the future or in the past and so the idea of quieting slowing down pausing and so i i call uh i use pause practices to become present so meditation mindfulness like shelly would talk about um and gratitude practices to help me be more present and so i talk about building my noticing muscle mm. presence um is the outcome of me building my noticing muscle 
And so it's about first awareness of self and what's going on and doing so from a place of curiosity, right? It's not about judgment. It's like, oh, Brian, you notice that? Oh, that's terrible. You're, you're this, you're that. It's, oh, that's interesting. Where's that coming from? And like, kind of stepping into it and from it, like you're a detective and you're kind of trying to understand what the root of something is so that you understand and maybe can name it and then you can potentially shift it from there. So it's really uh, the root of our being, as you're talking about your, our experience, and then it enables us to kind of step into curiosity with things that come up in a way that serves us and others. And that's the gift, as Reese was talking about, that I see with presence. Right. And so uh, what are some experiences you have in, on your journey of presence that might be interesting in terms of um, sharing with the listeners and um, helping them see in action, presence in action, and how that served you? So I loved what you said, Brian, uh, for so many reasons. It definitely is a practice. And I noticed before I began cultivating my practice of mindfulness that we live in a world of should and shouldn'ts. So there's a little story uh, that a uh, thought leader tells about a guy riding a horse down the road and a man on the road says, where are you going? And the guy says, I don't know, ask the horse. And that is my favorite story because wow. That's how a lot of us live our lives. We let our thoughts drive us instead of us driving our thoughts. And so I noticed I lived in a world of shoulds and shouldn'ts. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have said that. I should stay late. I shouldn't work this late. I should go home early. And we are constantly living in these distractions. And in mindfulness, there's three. It's I'll be happy when. I'll be happy when this is over. I'll be happy when it's the weekend. I'll be happy when I get a raise. I'll be happy when this person does this, this, and that. And then there is, you know, it, it's arguing with reality too. Like I can't be happy right now. So we're complaining. And when we're complaining about a colleague, when we're complaining about the culture, when we're complaining, those are different distractions that we don't notice and we all fall into these. So we argue with reality and we base our happiness on something that we have no control over far into the future. So when we can sort of bear witness to those thoughts, we're like, oh, that's what I, oh yes, that's the arguing person. Oh yes, that's the judgment. Oh yeah, that's the shoulder. So when we can bear witness, we actually have a choice. Wow. Love that, Shelly. <clears throat> Reese, what are, you, what are your thoughts in terms of uh, or experiences? I love the language, Shelly, about arguing with reality. That's one of my new favorites now. <laughs> I think I've, I've done that once or twice. <laughs> yeah, sure, Brian. So yeah, um, so many good things about what you said, uh, what all three of you said. And Shelly, I love that story about the horse. I, I might steal that. Um, <laughs> for me, one word that I didn't say when I was talking about it that came up after we, when I was listening to you is attention. So one of my things that I am really passionate about right now and, and learning to help in terms of facilitating workshops and things is around listening, deep listening. So when we talk about generative attention, it's one of the most important principles um, <clears throat> when it comes to, the, I studying a lot of the work of Nancy Klein uh, as a mutual friend of ours, Jane Adsed Grant, who I'm gonna be doing some studying with. Um, generative attention, is to me the essence of being present and, and deep listening is about being in the moment purely for the other person. You're clearing your own mind of your own thoughts, your own distractions, your own impetus to interrupt, your own propensity to try to let your ego overrule the other person. And rather it's what she teaches is really just very quiet, very appreciative feedback but very minimal. So we want to ignite their thinking. We want to be completely present with what they're doing at the, at the moment by just saying simple questions like, what else? What else would you do now? What if Th these sort of simple, incisive questions, as she calls them, are the most, she, she, she describes them as being replications of what our brain's natural function would be. When we're thinking about something, if we get stuck, this is a kind of process that the brain would have to try and, uh, and, and block. And sometimes that, doesn't happen for whatever reason, neurological reasons. So by being that sort of external brain like function and asking those incisive questions, we can ignite their thinking. So 
often someone might come to you with a question and you might know the answer and you might know exactly how to help them, but actually that is not going to help them at all. What you want to do is allow them to have that realization for themselves, have allow them to come to that own solution that will <clears throat> not just give them the answer, but it also give them the tools to find the answer again themselves or pass on that information to someone else. If they're a leader, you know, we're trying to impart these skills and tools so that they can then use them in their team or in their organization. So it comes back to attention and it comes down to um, listening. Right. What else, Reese? <laughs> <laughs> Save it for the next time. Wait the learning, Shelly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think I, I, this idea of paying attention is obviously showing up in what everybody's talking about. Um, so it made me think of, have you ever been in a situation where someone is paying attention? So when I think about someone being present, if you guys can think of an experience where someone was very present and that idea of deep listening was happening to you. So they're sitting across from you and, and you're experiencing this. Have you ever felt uncomfortable? <laughs> Mm -hmm. I feel connected actually. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm being honored um, because you can feel, you, actually, I believe you can feel it when someone's actually present because that's the thing, definition of presence, right? So it's like, I can say I'm showing up as present. I believe I'm present, but really presence is not something you determine. It's the people that you're engaging with determine if you're present or not, right? So mm -hmm. that's, that's the thing, right? I can be having a conversation with Reese and I think, oh, I'm really present. I'm listening. And he's thinking he's not feeling it. And so it's like, that's the definition of whether I'm present or not is determined by the person I'm engaged with. Yes. And so this notion of an attention is something that um, is really top of mind for me recently. And we talk about our time management. I, we talk about all these different things about, being more efficient and effective in our day. It's really about attention management. It's how do you focus your attention on the stuff that matters most, which links directly to prioritization, right? And so as I think about our conversation, where it's going and uh, attention and the things that um, we're talking about, I think presence is the foundation of choosing how you see. I talk about helping people see differently is what I do, right? So how can you see differently if you don't slow down enough to be present? Notice what's happening in the moment. Understand maybe that you may be restricting your, your sight in terms of what you're able to see so that you can get curious and explore different possibilities. So I think presence is the root of being able to, root of awareness, right? Root of ability to see differently and because once you're able to see differently, then you can change how you think, what you do, the results you get. And so the foundational nature of presence to all these important things in terms of awareness, attention, curiosity, and then seeing differently to create different opportunities and choices. That's where I, I go with presence and how, how impactful it is for each of us. Mm -hmm. And so thinking in terms of leadership, why would presence matter to leaders, right? What, what about what their um, role demands of them requires them to be present and to continue to Nancy's language of building the muscle of presence so that they can create better. We can do better, right? Create better for themselves and others um, on their teams and their um, organizations and even with self. Wow, Brian, you just said so many wonderful nuggets that resonate with me so deeply. And I will just re uh, refer back to something that I heard on one of Reese's podcasts. And something that I am intentional about is retiring the words paying attention and instead giving attention. Mm -hmm. And I loved hearing that from a thought leader, Oscar, I think his last name is Trimboli. So, so good to think of it as giving of attention and retiring paying. Like you don't owe somebody something, you're giving. But attention, that word, people get weird about the word meditation. Like they get the cringe factor, like we're supposed to be going with our hands together and they just, it, it, they can shut down. And I'm like, fine, call it 
attention training, attention training. It is the bicep curl of mindfulness, just like fitness is to work, to being exercises, to working out. Meditation is to mindfulness. So call it attention training. But I open up the question so often to what can being present do for us as leaders? And one of the things, Brian, that you kind of illuminated here was we get choice. When we are open, we get to choose. When we are not present and we're stuck in old ways of thinking, old ways of being, old ways of reacting, old behavior patterns, this is the way it's always been done. We don't have that beginner's mind. And I think having a beginner's mind being right here, right now, allows leaders to be open up to innovation, to creativity, to being more resilient after something didn't work and starting over right here, right now. It also invites us to be more compassionate because we're not stuck in these looping thoughts and all the stuff that our minds think that takes us away from that human connection with our teams and the people that we're with. So you really, to me, choice equals freedom. And when you can open up possibilities because you're not stuck in thought, you have choice and then you are free. So that's to me, one of the biggest gifts of presence. Right. I know someone, um, someone I knew in the past had said something really similar to that, where she said, awareness leads to choice, which leads to change. Like, um, but it starts with that idea of awareness, like that openness, that attention that starts at the beginning. Um, and that, because that puts us in a space to actually even decide what exactly is it that I, you would want to even want to change rather than just kind of automatically going to fix everything, which is kind of a natural state that we can go into this automotive way, like this automated way of thinking. Um, there's, there's this language that you use, Shelley, that really struck with me that beginner's mindset, I think is what you said, the beginner's mindset. So if I think about leaders, that's actually a really vulnerable place for someone to admit that they'd even want to be in this idea of being in a beginner's mindset, because what leader wants to say, Oh, I'm in a beginner's mindset, right? Come follow me. And it's, it's such a vulnerable place to be yet to your point to be in that space creates this openness for choice and, and just the word like compassion. Um, if I can see from that sort of a viewpoint, if I can just rewind and see what it was like to see through the eyes of a beginner, there's actually a lot more that comes out of that than just thinking that I have to be the know-it-all or the expert as the leader. Um, but it does require this willingness to be vulnerable, to be in that spot, to say that I'm willing to be in a beginner's mindset and allow my team to be in a similar mindset as needed. Yeah. So like what you said there, you mentioned something about automation, which made me think about <clears throat> often in our job, whether it's just a member of the team or whether it's the leader, you kind of come in, there are functions that you perform, there are habits or behaviors, you get into a cycle and you just kind of, I guess similar to what uh, Shelley was saying about the, the horse story, you're not in control of where it's going and you just literally have to stop, slow down, remove all those distractions and then just silence. You mentioned earlier about uncomfortable and to me immediately, I thought you were talking about, oh, the uncomfortable silence when really the silence is, uh, is one of the, the most important tools that we use when we're working with with people in coaching or whoever it might be and you know the phrase let silence do the heavy lifting it, it, it again goes back to the person giving them the opportunity to be present with their own thoughts and allow those thoughts to create the answer um, <clears throat> often we say that the person who asks the question is actually the person who will come up with the best answer so doing this kind of process of uh, allowing them the time to think for themselves and not follow those familiar patterns, not be um, <clears throat> in that automated process and slow down and reflect. So self-awareness, self-care and self-empathy, these, these two things are quite similar to me. And I think those are the things that a leader needs to practice first. And as we say, you do it for yourself first and then you can do it for other people. So being present is absolutely one of those most important things about understanding that. Uh, potential within us. 
Um, <clears throat> if we're always rushing, if we're always too quick to move on to the next thing, if we're not taking time to appreciate what's happened, not taking time to be grateful of what's happened, <clears throat> or even forgive what's happened, um, we are not going to give ourselves the opportunity to really <clears throat> understand where where the answer could be and where we might be able to inspire other people. So that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. It does. And, and so uh, to build on that a little, what you had me thinking about, Reese, was and I talk a lot about reacting versus responding, right? And there's neuroscience behind it too. And so we're so busy. We're so kind of in our, in our lane and in our zone. And if we don't pause and kind of get present and open up the possibilities like Shelly was talking about, um, we could be on autopilot, like that auto automation you were talking about. And as Nancy was talking about awareness, choice, and change, there's this notion that came up for me about intention, right? So, and response is an intention, reaction is not necessarily an intention, right? So when we're trying to disrupt a pattern, right? So if I get triggered, if I'm frustrated, and I want to get myself out of it, Typically, there's a pause practice that we, whatever that might be, a breathing exercise, a mantra that you're working on to build a new, um, new neural pathway or a new muscle. And so this notion of intention, first you have to notice, right? You have to notice that it's happening and then you say, wait a minute, I know what that's doing. It's going to lead me down that rabbit hole. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. Wait a minute, I want to show up differently. And that's giving you that pause to respond rather than react. Because reaction is usually built based on fear and stress and um, cortisol, which shuts off access to the part of our brain, which allows us to respond and be ourselves with, and be, have access to um, problem solving and other um, skills that we would normally have. And so how do we interrupt that pattern so we can intentionally respond and get maybe get curious and bring in some of these other qualities that enable us to lead effectively um, or do we stay rooted in what we know because there's a comfort zone there, right? And there's a, even, it, we might even know that it's not the thing we need to do, but we're, we're just, we're not going to be vulnerable as Nancy was talking about, right? And step into the, the growth zone, which requires us to be a little bit uncomfortable. And so we talk a lot in coaching, we, you know, we've mentioned some of the things with coaching. It's, it's embracing the discomfort. Growth is uncomfortable. And so if we reframe the, we notice the feeling of uncomfortable. If we reframe that as something that's positive and it's a step on our journey to creating better, to growth, what does that open up for us, right? Instead of the reaction, the primitive brain, the um, default reaction we have is, oh, fear, let's avoid it. Let's kind of suppress it. Let's or suppress feeling, suppress this or um, avoid, right? And so what if we what if we reframed our thoughts around that? Those feelings that shut us down, what if we reframe that and created a practice, a pause practice or a mechanism for us to redirect that energy that opens us up? Mm -hmm. uh, Brian, thank you so much. The word practice keeps coming up for a reason. If you remember back in the 90s, you'd walk into an office and there'd be these inspirational posters as you'd walk down the hall and they'd say, believe, courage, climb every mountain, you know, challenge, whatever they were. And they, to me, are like the 90s version of the keep calm and carry on stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you've ever been really, really freaked out or stressed out, if you saw on your desk, keep calm and carry on, would you like hit your head and go, oh, that's right, I'm fine now. You know, it does, it, it's the, I call it the what without the how. So it's like you see on social feeds, you see the same thing. There's a lot of telling us what to do, telling leaders what to do, but they're not inviting them to a how. And what I love about so many of us is we are inviting people to different practices and my way by inviting them to mindfulness may not be the right thing, but there's lots of different ways. And so it's so important to give people the how along with the what. And whatever that practice looks like, that is the invitation. That is not, you get a certificate and boom, you're transformed. So I love this conversation. Yeah. And I think there's value in helping leaders or any, not just leaders, but anybody who might be in a, 
in a situation where things, let's say, are fast moving. And I think fast moving because that's really the world that we're all in, right? Like everything is changing all the time. So right now, this conversation we're having is like in a removed setting. We're having this conversation. So how, to your point, Shelly, the how is in, okay, how do we take this and put it, plug it into your everyday life? And that's what's that's what's needed, right? Like we can have, and that's the whole thing with even meditation. Sometimes it can seem like, well, that's so removed, but it's understanding that you remove yourself, you can build a practice, but then it's about building it back into your daily work. So as I think about, let's just take an example. You know, you have a bunch of senior leaders getting together. They're talking about some big changes that are happening within their organizations. It's going to have significant um, structural impact for them, significant financial impact for them. So it's a high stakes sort of conversation that's happening. How in a situation like that, do we encourage leaders to practice presence? Like what could it tangibly look like? What, how, how would that look like in practice in that moment? I'm just curious what everybody's thoughts are on that. Well, I invite teams to turn off all their devices and actually take a minute or two to get present, mm -hmm. to be here, be now, be in the room with each other. That's awesome. And what about kind of just back to your noticing muscles? You know, we go from meeting to meeting to meeting. Like there's no travel time ever put into the schedule for, I've got to go from building A to building B. I've got, I'm booked, I'm busy. I'm just, my, my calendar's fully booked. I'm triple booked, all this stuff, right? And so that's great. And so when you're, you've just come from a, a meeting where you, it was charged, right? You're somehow charged up. And how can you fully be present for the next meeting unless you somehow take a moment to get present and get connected and open so that you can open up to the conversation and engage with it effectively? And so that one, can we do the invitation so that you can make an invitation. So what I'm noticing is, Shelly, I see you just came from a meeting and um, I'm, I'm wondering if you might uh, join me in a moment of just kind of uh, getting settled before we start and, and that might put us in a, a good place for a better place for a meeting. Would you be open to that? Kind of an invitation along those lines because what it does is it honors the person and honors yourself and it honors the conversation you're about to have. Mm -hmm. But we're so kind of focused on, I got to go, I got to go, move, 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 fast movement, and everything's fast paced, Nancy was talking about, and that's the world we live in. And what do we all, and leaders especially, need most? To slow down. Mm -hmm. Oh, but there's a, a scarcity. Oh my God, if I slow down, then I'm going to have to get... Yeah, but slow down to speed up. How much more effective will your conversations be if you take one minute to just do a breathing exercise or just to sit in silence if that's what it is it, 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 there's many different ways there's not one way to do presence and not one way to do attention training which i love that that reframe um call it what you want right what language you're going to connect to it's the is it are you gonna is it gonna enable you to do it to call it something different than do that but the point is to not so if the, if the idea comes to you and you don't with integrity bring that out as an invitation what does that say right that's that's kind of like you're you're holding back the gift that Reese was pointing us to mm -hmm. and then you can make the invitation and the other person may decline it but the integrity with yourself is to make the invitation mm -hmm. yeah so we're all, we're all spending far too much time in meetings so um one thing i try and encourage people to do is obviously to get the most out of those meetings, but everyone's coming in with different energies. They've got different expectations. They've got different um, <clears throat> things on their mind, pr priorities, but this is a meeting for all of us together to connect. For us to connect, we need to stop. We need to pause and I invite everyone to, 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 to check in. You know, that's just a phrase that we use. So it can be, it's like a, a pause button, if you like, or a stop button. And it's an opportunity for everything that's going on outside to be left outside in in a, an emotional sort of way, not like, you know, the actual facts and figures and things like that. But it gives us a chance to <clears throat> leave behind what we're coming in as individuals and connect together as, as a group. So by having this check in, we're also, I'm asking Brian, what's happening with you? Give me something about your, your family life or something like something that's not work related, perhaps that's always a good way to do it, because it breaks that connection between what you're really thinking about here 
yes, I'm showing up in this meeting. Yes, I'm, I've got my mask on. Like, yes, I'm paying attention, but really I'm thinking about what, all the other things I've got to do for the rest of my day. So we need to try and create a kind of break or a boundary in there between any, in your brain and then you can connect with the four people that we're having a conversation with and once you've done that it's almost like a collective sigh and a release and the energy will change in the room and it gives you more more commitment to finding the solution I think so <clears throat> that to me is about being present it's about <clears throat> creating creating a, that pause you know we, we, we some Brian has described having his own activities and we can't all just come into a meeting and start meditating for five minutes or the Shelley doing your latest pose. I know you love, um, <clears throat> um, we need to have something that's actually different. That's actually meaningful to us in that moment. So in that moment we can, and it all comes back to connection, you know, so much, th so many things for me this year is all about connection and, and real connection, not superficial connection not um yeah we're connected yeah let's do this uh, and then there's no real depth to it there's just um <clears throat> a pretense um so yeah pretense present interesting um sorry so here sorry i've lost my chain of thought now <laughs> no, no worry so uh, something that came up for me with what you were sharing there reese is a, a mindset reframe that uh i'd never considered before you said meetings are for us to connect. How many people in the business world would say that? We're about doing, and we we got to get stuff done. We've got to move forward at you know we're even faster pace than we came into the meeting with, right? And it's like you know speed, 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 move, move, move. And so, I love the you talked about connection, and I believe presence is about connection. That's how we fully connect with people. So when we are present and we're in that choice mode that Shelly talked about, right? Because it's open at that point. And so meetings are for us to connect. And so how do we, this is getting to purpose and it's also getting a little bit to culture. What if a manager says, wait a minute, my, our goal here is to have an effective meeting, right? What can we align to? I'm gonna invite us all into, even if it's just silence and closing your eyes and, and reflecting on whatever it is, you, don't, you can do whatever you want, but just kind of redirecting and diffusing the energy you came in with so that you can connect to yourself so that you can connect with the team and have an effective conversation. I think that's a powerful reframe, Reese. Thanks for that. And, and when you're trying to make a decision, everyone's coming in with different ideas, but unless you've had that, that, uh, that connection in the first place, there's going to be conflict. And I understand that conflict creates innovation and it can find the right solution, but especially if you're talking like a senior leadership team where ego is a really important um, elephant in the room, you need to kind of break that down initially so that we can have this level playing field where all the ideas will be invited. And also by doing this check-in, it means everyone's had a, a chance to speak. It's not just the usual people taking control or dominating the conversation. Everyone's had that. It's like an ice-breaking uh, idea. And then once you've already committed, you feel safer and more sort of trusting environment so you can just you feel freer to continue with your ideas so actually you might get to a better idea than if it had just been the same three people who usually dictate the meeting um <clears throat> so that's 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 where i was going when i lost my thought <laughs> thanks for that reese and so you, you had me think too in terms of so we have habits right we always I'm scheduling a meeting with you, Nancy. Let's make it for an hour. Shelly, we're having a meeting. It's going to be, everybody schedules hour meetings without thinking, do I need an hour? What's the agenda? What is the goal for the meeting? It, I mean, that was the meaning affecting this behavior. We started having a focus on that at one point when I was in the corporate world, which is great. But there's still that. So then what Reese is pointing us to helps us with, let's rethink about our meeting practice, scheduling practices and the habits there and agendas and understanding that we have different people in there and there may be some strategic thinkers that if you want a decision or a, a thought from someone or input from someone that needs to ponder something you need to as the leader for the meeting send it to them ahead of time so they can digest it give it appropriate thought and come with a, a, a input that's well thought out and so that takes a second to pause reflect and say okay this is what i'm looking to achieve in the meeting 
This will be the agenda. These are the people that need to be there. Again, does everybody need to be at the meeting or does Shelly, Nancy, and Reese need to be in the meeting? And so that kind of thinking gets to these conditioning, the automated practices that we've been come conditioned to to say, wait a minute, what if I honor the intent of the meeting, the time of everybody in the meeting in terms of uh, how I uh, make requests about the meeting and define the agenda for the meeting. And so again, purpose, connectedness. And what, what I think is a representation of just doing the, what we always do is we have a meeting to figure out what the meeting should be about. And that's laziness, right? Yeah. And so I, go ahead, sorry. Sorry, I, I'm sorry. You made me think of a, of a, of a word. It, it's a bad word, it's meeting hygiene. So maybe it's meeting health of a meeting. And not only does it include being an intentional about who and the timing, but it's about being on time for the meeting, respecting each other's time, allowing people to finish their thought like I just didn't with you, <laughs> allowing, you know, and taking a pause after somebody has spoken so those same three people aren't taking over. And yes, we all want to be heard. And yes, we all want to affirm other people. But it's the, almost this notion of, let this person finish, take a moment. And it's also really about what does your organization, what does a healthy meeting look like? What does a healthy meeting look like? Co-create it together. What are the terms of health that you want to bring to your organization's meetings? And I do this in my workshop because I show a picture of a meeting and I'm like, what's the feeling, what's the thought? People are like, boring, too long, you know, takes me away from my work, all that stuff. I'm like, great. Let's take a look at what possibilities we can create around a meeting. We have meetings, they're never gonna go away. So what are the things, some of the mindful things that we can do and be held accountable for with intention to make meetings more meaningful or healthy? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Love that. I loved like some of the practical things that just came out of the conversation that, that we just had. So when, when we, look to help somebody else to say, hey, what would that look like? You talked about the how, Shelly. Like some of the key things that are like standing out to me from what each of you have shared is, for example, when you're having a conversation with people, whether it's a meeting or just something that's a bit more informal, turn off your phones. Like that's one way of just being in a simple way, being present. And because I, I think sometimes when we talk being present, it's got this like feel, maybe like meditation does, this feel around it that people are like, Oh, we're talking about, I'm like, we can, we can simplify this into something really simple. So yes, it's simple as, so the idea of paying attention, the bet I can pay better attention if my attention isn't divided. So turn off, turn off your phones while we are having this conversation. Um, the idea that you mentioned, Brian, about this, like go, the go, go, go around, like I'm back to back, back to back, back to back and having, I'm sure we've all done that. Like I know I did it very frequently. And the idea of like one, either make a decision that I'm not going to do the back to back, or if that becomes a, just something that I'm not able to control then as a leader, like the person owning the conversation, owning the meeting to say, hey, everyone, I understand that possibly there's a few of you here who've had a few back to back things coming in. So what I would love to be able to do is set up a little bit of a time and then just whatever that is 10 minutes. And that could then allow, as you said, Brian, invite people into what do they need to pause for that moment or whatever it is that they need. Like that's a very simple practice that can be taken on. Love what you shared about checking in, Reese. Like that's a practice that can be a very simple practice. Just we create that. And I, I know certainly in my previous life, like there were teams where we did that on. It was just a simple check-in. It was, and we actually had, it was, I don't even know why we, it was just, I can't remember, was it a cane or an umbrella or something? I have no idea why it was that item. I think it was started with somebody said, why don't we use this? And it just got passed around. <laughs> and if somebody, if anybody who had something just to bring up, they would pull that and say, you know, this is kind of what's been happening as I'm coming here. This is what's coming in with me. And it was almost like this idea of like verbalizing it and everyone understood, okay, got it. That's what you're coming in with. And now I've set it aside, but it was just that idea of connection in the sense like at least you can understand why I'm, my energy might be off a little bit and but because bringing people together. Um, and one practice that I know has helped, I know it's helped me a lot, especially like if you have something one-on-one -on -one with somebody and you have a lot of mental chatter happening <laughs> inside, because I get a lot of mental chatter, is to do a brain dump 
before a call with somebody. Just write it down. Like this is all my assumptions and things. And when it's out here, it's no longer present in the conversation. Like it's almost gone because of, but I haven't ignored it either. Like I've just said, like these are there, these assumptions or thoughts or whatever, and you dump them and then you can actually be mentally present because these things are not chattering in here anymore. But I feel like those are really practical things that leaders or anybody can take on and that creates presence, like in the moment presence, right? This is like in the moment cultivating an ability to do that and it doesn't require meditate. Like, you know what I mean? Like whatever meditate, when people think like that bigger meditation, what they think it is, it's, it's in the moment. And I, and I feel like that's value. Um, that we can all apply pretty quickly in whatever way we want to. Nancy, you just made me think of something really important. One of the biggest gifts that presence can do for people, for the other person is make them feel safe. And so when we think about safety in the workplace, when you feel safe to be who you are in the workplace and somebody gives you the gift of their presence to help allow you that safety. Like you were talking about passing the umbrella. We did that in a place where I worked. It wasn't an umbrella, but that notion becomes like the Christmas of, you know, kind of loses its original meaning when you don't, when it's just kind of one of those routine things and yet you feel such a disconnect with everybody all the other times and then you're supposed to talk and have fun for the first few minutes of a meeting. Yeah. So really this notion of presence gives people that feeling of safety, which is crucial for well-being in the workplace. Absolutely. And I think that may be why it brings me back to that question I had earlier about feeling uncomfortable. I wonder if that sense of discomfort, if someone is giving you that, like their presence and you're in that silence and they're paying attention. If I don't feel safe, then that sort of awareness that gets created around me, it, it makes it uncomfortable rather than a place of, oh my goodness, I, 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 this person is giving me something of themselves. So yeah, absolutely. It kind of brings us back to that beginning part of, being aware ourselves and kind of that sense of like, do I feel safe? Because if I don't, then it'll actually show up in these kinds of places with discomfort when someone does give me their attention. So yeah, that's actually a really, really interesting piece. So I love the words, we, we're talking about presence, but listen to the words that come up, connection, safety, or I'll say psychological safety, right? Um, these are basic human needs, right? And Nancy gave us a great practice, right? And so ultimately, whether it's writing stuff out, because you need to release, right? So the, the point, like, I think to Nancy's point before meeting to kind of uh, get present is to release what may already be there in some form or fashion. It could be writing it out like that. Or it could be some fo form of an uh, attention training. I'll start using that language because I love it. Um, <laughs> could be meditation or whatever, but breathing exercise. It's just some way to release what's there so that you're not carrying the, what's happened before into the present moment so you can be open to choose and you're able to engage in a conversation with a focus that you couldn't otherwise. And so it's practices, back to practice is another word that we're talking about. And it's possible too. We can all do this. It's just, it's not like that, like Nancy said, yep. I'm just going to go pick the uh, the presence uh, tab off the uh, the wall there. Now I've got the presence tab. I'm good. Good <laughs> for the day. I walk in, put my stuff down, go pick the presence tab. I've got my presence for the day. No, you've got to, it's 24 seven, not 24 seven, but it's all the time. It's how do I start building the muscle of connecting, getting presence, my awareness, noticing, not having judgment about what I notice. So it's acceptance too, right? all these things and so the invitation becomes um, to meet yourself where you are where am i because where we and nancy and, and shelly are that's perfect i don't need to be where they are and they don't need to be where i am i need to understand where i am and focus on getting better right we can do better it's personal and then when we're leading it's about kind of understanding the energy and the space in the room is what if we developed a practice about put, handing around a cane or we did like, I think 
whenever somebody else talked in a meeting or whatever, we toss a ball. So there was this kind of energy of connecting the team. There's some kind of a ritual or a practice that becomes the teams that gets us connected, right? And so there's so many different things we can do. So we invite the, the people listening on, what do you do? What are some practices that you do to connect, to um, get present before meetings? And what is the experience after you do that? What are people talk about high performing teams, high performing teams. Is that from the doing perspective? And what about the being contributes to the doing? We're talking about the being piece. And the being piece, when we get into a place of connectedness, presence, uh, awareness, psychological safety, that's when the creativity, the innovation, the new ideas come from. Because you're confident enough and feel like you're valued enough and you're seen and you're heard enough to bring your contributions. And then your ideas spawn other ideas and we get discretionary effort and all these positive things come so we can, what I call retire the work mask. That's sort of a little bit of my mission is to retire the work mask. And I believe that um, presence is a foundation for that as we talked about in terms of uh, contribution and how we show up. And so fascinating places that this conversation went today. And I thank you all for that. As we come to a close, I wanna invite you to share uh, something you'd like to leave the listeners with or um, something that was a, a huge learning or takeaway from today that um, you're going to continue to bring forward in terms of how you engage. Shelly? So again, this was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. I think the only thing that I want to share and the thing that I always lead with is how you show up matters. Hmm. Love that. Reese. Yeah, I just wanted to, you mentioned energy right at the start and I touched on it a bit. And I think um, <clears throat> the thing for me, when we're talking about the person, when we're talking about leadership or anything, from a personal point of view, the energy that we waste on thinking about something that's gone or something that might happen takes away so much potential from what we can actually create in that moment in ourselves. So don't waste energy on meaningless pasts fraught futures and just focus on you in this moment and it's focus more on being than doing love that thanks Reese. nancy i'm having a hard time picking just one thing to, there's so much that's come up things then that's fine <laughs> oh man it's actually been like really powerful for me to hear this conversation because it truly is like I'm experiencing the conversation as we're having it, like just my own learnings as I'm, as I'm going through this. Because as I said, this idea of being present to me is a practice. And, and earlier on, Shelly, we had just joking, we were talking about like this idea of arriving at it is not it's not really there because the moment we arrive means we stop noticing. And so what, what exactly is I probably went back to the beginning of where I was if I was to do that. So, so that is, that's really there. And, and, and really a lot of what we've talked about is just reaffirming that for me, this idea of the importance of practice and the, and the value that it has. It's, it is, it is actually a giving that's involved in that it's for myself and it's for others. So it's a combination that's happening, but um, it's really sticking out to me, um, the idea that we talked about, I wrote it down here, when we can bear witness, we actually have a choice. And so that, that's kind of what's staying with me at this point is like, as the more present I am, the more choices I create, the greater ability I have to impact change is really what's, uh, what's sticking with me. And in that doing that, it's actually not just about myself, it's actually what I'm able to do for others in that process of me being present, that, that attention, because a lot of people, a lot of people would want someone to listen to them. They want someone to pay attention, right? Like we know how it feels when somebody gives us their attention, we feel like we're valued. And so the ability to do that, one for myself first, as in pay attention to myself, pay attention to what's happening, um, building that practice, but that practice then makes me that much more aware of, man, I'm picking up something from Shelly, I'm picking up something from Reese and just being attentive to what's happening. Um, it's amazing. 
I, I, I don't know if everybody realizes how amazing it is. Um, so it's just a reinforcement for me and I encourage everybody else listening in as well to kind of think about how do you continue to build that practice because the potential for it is actually amazing like where it can take us. So thank you for this conversation. It's actually been really helpful for me. Thank you, Nancy, wonderful. And so uh, a bunch of things come up for me too. So what I'll focus my thoughts are on the distinction between giving attention and paying attention. Um, giving attention is an energy, right? It's, it's directional towards others and it's, there's intention with giving energy. Um, and the language, I think language matters. So this notion of attention training and presence. And so what you got me thinking about, um, when you talked about energy Reese and Nancy in terms of giving is this notion of, well, how do we create our conditions? And, you know, we talk about trust and safety and connection. And there can be a mindset at times for, waiting for the leader to, to create that for us. What if we just created it and led with, we're going to bring and be like you talked about kind of showing, how do we show up? How do we intentionally show up? Create trust from the start, create connection, be that, that be your way of being, choose that. And being present and having the awareness and making the choice that that's how you want to show up and be, uh, with other people and for other people. And that's the energy and an environment you want to create so that others can thrive. So create trust first. Don't, in terms of earning trust, no, give it, give it. create it. Connection, give it, create it. Safety, give it, create it. And so that's sort of what, where my energy is right now in terms of, um, we don't have to wait. We can make the choice with ourselves how we show up and then look at what happens with the energy of other people, how when that trust builds with another person and then maybe with another, how that creates a different dynamic for the team so that we can get to better. And so now that we've connected it back to the, we can do better conversations. I'll thank you all, Shelly, Reese, and Nancy for this conversation. And I want to uh, invite the listeners in to extend and enrich the conversation with your experiences, your thoughts, your practices around presence that have helped you create better. Share those in the comments, invite others into the conversation who might uh, enjoy it and find it valuable. And let's continue to create better together every day. Thank you. <laughs>